Welcome everyone to our office hours this afternoon. Um, it is three o'clock, so I am going to go ahead and get started just so we can get everybody out here, out of here as soon as we can this afternoon. I'm sure you're all very anxious to get on with your evening. Um, so this is being recorded. Uh, if you need to go back and reference it, we've been dropping or Ashley has been dropping the links to the PowerPoint in the chat. These are the only links we have available right now, but at the end, if you offer a con, if you fill out our feedback form, um, you'll get copies in the email that come with the contact hour certificate. So uh, that's the only way we can do it with these office hours. So I know it's not fantastic, but <clears throat> we try our best with it. Um, all right, so we're gonna get started. So today in our office hours, we're talking about the advanced written notice and the written notice. So that's our focus for today. So we are going to do quick team introductions. We'll talk about the advanced written notice. We'll go through the written notice. We'll talk about the importance in case law, talk about some other considerations and go over any questions that come up along the way. Feel free to drop questions in the chat or if you dare, come off of mute and ask questions. We're okay with that too, either way. And we'll also share some resources at the end. So this is our team. My name is Carly Thibodeau, and I have been with the team for just over two years. And before that, I was a teacher for 21 years. And with me today is Ashley. Hi, everybody. My name is Ashley Satry, and I joined the team a little over a year ago. Before that, I was a special ed teacher for 14 years. And Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Pelletier. I have been with DOE for seven years now. And prior to that, I was admin support at a K-5 elementary school for 16 years. Excellent. Thank you. And then Colette Sullivan is our federal programs coordinator. And Jennifer Gleason is another member of our team. And they're both busy doing other things. So they're not able to be with us this afternoon, but they are part of the team. So we're going to start off with talking about the advanced written notice. And the procedural manual is a great resource, goes over all of those special ed forms if you're not familiar with it. Um, but this link should take you to the procedural manual if you have, if you're able to access the electronic copy of this PowerPoint. Um, and you can find the advanced written notice on page three that goes over all the directions and instructions for that. <clears throat> so basically the advanced written notice is used to provide notice to parties of an upcoming meeting, team meeting, whether it's an IEP meeting or an IFSP. So this is what the advanced written notice looks like for the state of Maine. And the information on here comes from IDEA and MUSER, where it says that the notice must indicate the purpose, time, and location of the meeting. So those are the reasons for this first section of the advanced written notice. So all this information really does need to be filled in here, including that student identifying information at the top. Um, and then of course, when the meeting is scheduled, where, and the purpose. Um, on that second page of the advanced written notice, you'll also be including who will be in attendance at the meeting. So this is where you would wanna list any of those members that have, uh, <clears throat> that are listed here, like the regular education teacher, you would put their name there. And obviously there are some blank spots there so you can fill in those others that may not be pre-filled out and you can put what their role is so that the people invited are aware who of who is going to be there. Now, it's also important to note those attempts to contact the parent. Um, these are necessary to show that you made that attempt to ensure that they had an opportunity to attend and that scheduling the meeting at a mutually agreed upon time and place. So that's very important. So you can see here, it says that um, at least two attempts should be recorded on the advance written notice so that you have that documentation for those attempts. I know that, I believe personally, when I was still doing these, I went for three just to cover myself. I always tried for that third time, 
but you only need to do two according to this form. And it may be different um, per SAU because this is a main state form. However, you have vendors that take those forms and put them into their computer system. And so things may be slightly different. And then there's this spot on that advanced written notice for the parent to sign if they waive their seven day advance notice of the IEP meeting. So if you schedule that IEP meeting and it happens with, and you don't have that seven day notice, you just need to make sure that you get a signature from the parent or guardian to make sure that you are documenting that they have given up that seven days notice and that the IEP meeting can be held sooner than those seven days. And then there's always an enclosure spot on most of the forms, but on the advanced written notice, this is a spot where you may include those procedural safeguards that you're sending those home along with the advanced written notice. Um, we recommend this or it's best practice to do that when you have an initial referral. If you're having an initial referral meeting, the best place to document that you offered procedural safeguards would be in an enclosure on the advanced written notice of that initial referral meeting. So this could be listed here. Um, if you're sending home any evaluation reports with that advanced written notice for the parents to have ahead of time, you can note that here or anything else you may be sending along with the advanced written notice. All right, now this is very specific to those um, writing advanced written notice for students with transition or where you're going to be talking about transition plans for the post-secondary transition. So when you are doing that for your ninth graders or older or 16 year olds or older, then best practice would to be in Inviting that student in the salutation, you can see here it's mom, dad, and Bill. Bill would be the student. However, just making sure that they're listed as a participant or an invitee on that second page is compliant. So just making sure that you're inviting the child if it's a child or student that will be discussing a transition plan. And then also remembering that on this front page, when you're checking off the purpose of the meeting, you want to check off that post-secondary goals and transition services. If you're going to be discussing that, that is necessary, that would be compliant. Um, typically we see this along with the annual review. I know this is really small, um, but typically those are checked off because you are required to discuss the transition plan and services at least annually, so. If you're doing it more often, then you would check that anytime you're going to be talking about transition. So this is very specific to transition because we look at these pieces when we look at transition plans. So I just wanted to make sure to be um, specific about that. All right, any questions about the advanced written notice? I know that one's pretty quick. There's not a lot of meat to it, but I have there a question. Any questions? I have a question. I'm I'm a bold one and I unmute. Sure. Um, I am wondering um, if a say an admin at the last minute decides to switch with a different admin to lead the meeting, do I have to make a whole new advanced written notice? No. The okay. advanced written notice is just to let people know that the possible those are the people invited. So okay. the people invited don't always show up. So, yeah. All right, thanks. I have a question. If the purpose of a meeting, say, was to review an evaluation, and then you get to the meeting and, say, a parent wants to start talking about other areas of the program, kind of like a program review, uh, is that acceptable, or uh, how do you manage that? Yes, you would just because your advanced written notice is just letting them know why you're holding the meeting. So if then at the actual meeting, things change and you start doing other things, you would just note that purpose on the written notice. You could add those extra pieces to the written notice. Thank you. You're welcome. I see a question in chat about, um, does it need to be password protected 
in an email? That is a great question. I know that in Muser, it talks about that this is a document that you can send electronically. The regulations do not specify whether it needs to be password protected or not. So I think that that would be up to your, that would be a local decision, whether you choose to do that. If we have three attempts and can't get a hold of the parent, can the school evaluate without permission? Um, if, this is different than evaluating. So Muser has very, and IDEA have specific regulations around initial evaluations and re-evaluations as far as getting attempts for consent for evaluation. But if you're asking if you can hold the meeting without the parent, if you have your attempts documented on the advance written notice, you can hold the meeting without the parent in attendance. You're welcome. All right. We're going to start talking about the written notice. Um, but if you have if you have other questions that come up about the advanced written notice, feel free to come back to that. It's okay. Um, so the written notice, huh? This is everyone's favorite, right? <laughs> it's it's a very tricky document because there's compliance, but it's so individualized as far as how you fill this out. And yeah, so we'll go through the compliance pieces of this. But again, this is the link to that procedural manual. And the written notice is gone over in detail in the procedural manual on page 87 is where it begins. Um, so you can access that there if you have any questions. So let's just talk about the written notice a little bit. This is based on federal law from IDEA and it's also part of MUSER. It's in the appendix as part of the procedural safeguards. Um, when you read the questions on the written notice, it talks about you or your, and when they're using that language, they're talking about the parent. Um, and the whole reason behind the written notice is this is the document that gives the parents time to review the decisions that were made at the IEP team meeting before those decisions go into effect. And so they have their seven days to review those proposals um, or refusals, and then they can change their mind if they so choose. Um, and one thing about the written notice is that this is the document that if you have any kind of legal action coming up with a student or special education student or anyone in your SAU, this is really the written record of how and why decisions are made. So that's why it's important to fill this out to the best of your ability, because when they review these, if a legal situation were to come up, what is documented in the written notice um, really helps your case to show like how and why your decisions were made at those meetings. And it can kind of either make the decision for in favor of the SAU, or it could sway them to say, no, the parent was in the right here. So as much as um, we don't like to get into, you know, the legal stuff, this really is your documentation, if anything were to come up with that. So this is just a snippet of the requirements um, from the regulations. So this is taken from MUSER, the Maine Unified Special Ed Regulations. And that's why there are some regular, like regular typed words. And then there are some that are in italics because IDEA is the regular type words. That's the federal regulation. And then the state can add um, their own on top of that, like make it, I'm not gonna find the right words for this. Uh, they can add to that. So for example, in this very first part, it says that the SAU must give you written notice, meaning the parent, um, at least seven days prior. So see that italicized part? The federal regulations didn't stipulate a certain time frame, 
but Maine went above and beyond and said, no, it has to be at least seven days prior to when those will go into effect. So that's just kind of how this is broken down. So every time you see those italicized words, that's the main interjecting, this is how we want you to do it here. Um, and then these are all the pieces of the written notice. So you'll see, if you can see this tiny little script, um, basically most of these are those questions that are on the written notice, but there are a few that are just embedded within the written notice. So for example, like, the names and titles of each member. That's that one of the end page where you have to write the people and their titles um, of who attended the meeting. So they're not always the questions, um, but the questions are embedded within here. So we're going to go through this a little bit. Let me take a look though. I saw something come up in the chat box. If the attempts are not documented in the advance written notice, can you still hold the meeting if proper time was given? That's a great question. I am not 100% sure because it says that you really do need to make attempts. And it looks like on our main state form, we're asking for at least two attempts. Um, so I would have to get back to you about a solid answer on that. But I'm thinking that if the parent cannot attend, then you should really document those attempts. If the parent is attending, that's a different story, but we'll get a solid answer for you. I think Ashley's writing that down for me. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so back to the written notice. Uh, so this is around that timeline. So we were, I was just kind of pointing that out on the other thing. So on our written notice for Maine, it says right in the beginning, dear so-and-so, and usually your vendors will pre-fill like the student or uh, parent information here. So a lot of this is pre-filled if you're using a vendor. Um, but you need to send this written notice out at least seven days prior to the date that the services are going to begin. And um, so, yeah, so that's how this works. Oh, I meant to undo these, but that's okay. I'll just click through them all. Okay, so here we go. If you think about it like this, and I think I did it backwards. How did I do that? My little arrows are going backwards because I was trying to think about this. And it's like, okay, these are the dates. This is the date that I'm saying that the IEP is going to go in effect or these services that I'm saying is going to happen. So 10, 15, 24. Now, I need to make sure that the parent gets the written notice in their hands seven days before the 15th. So that means I would have to make sure that I'm sending that written notice or that they're receiving that written notice on the 8th. And then this three plus days guidance thing that says up here, this is because, you know, usually you're mailing it. So you need to send, leave some time for the mail. So really you should be mailing it no later than 10-5 if you're saying those things are going to start on the 15th. That gives you time for mail, and then that gives you the parents that seven days to have that information to review, and then services can be implemented. <clears throat> okay, that's and then down here, that's everything I just said. So that's the timeline piece. Now, parents can waive that seven-day notice. So the, if you had that meeting on the 5th and then you wanted to start the IEP on the 6th, the parents can say, yeah, that's fine. I waive my seven-day notice. Go ahead and start it immediately. And you can just note in the written notice that the parent waived their right to seven-day notice. It must be documented in the written notice that the parent waived their right. It's not an IEP team decision that the, um, the, the seven-day notice doesn't happen. It's a parent that can waive that right to the seven-day notice. And then that IEP can be implemented whenever you choose or before the seven days, okay? But it does need to be documented, such as a statement like this. And this says it's in section one, 
It doesn't matter which section you put it in. It just needs to be somewhere in the written notice. We just say section one because that's just, it's right there. Okay. So there is a time when the parent or guardian cannot waive their seven day notice. Um, does anybody know when that is? Initial and when they are not in attendance. Thank you. Yes, and people are dropping it in the chat also. We have updated guidance around this. It's actually only one instance and it's when they do not attend the meeting. Prior, we were giving guidance that it couldn't be, the uh, seven day notice cannot be waived at initials. However, we had a conversation with our assistant attorney general and she actually said, no, informed consent means informed consent. So there was no stipulation on that initial, as long as you have the initial provision signature that services can start, the parent can waive their seven day notice. So the only time they can't waive their seven day notice is actually if they do not attend the meeting. Okay, so here's another thing to think about. What if you hold the meeting, but the parent or guardian is not in attendance. Can you call them later, like after the meeting and share the details with them and get their thoughts and ideas? Right, I have a no in the chat, right? I have a couple, yes. So that is correct. Like you, if you want to have parent input, contact them prior to the meeting and make sure to document in the written notice that the parent wasn't able to attend the meeting, but they gave input and you can put that in the written notice. But re uh, reaching out to them after the meeting and getting their input after the meeting would most likely change some of the decisions that were made because the parent may have some thoughts about things. And then you would need to write an amendment or an additional written notice um, and amend pieces of the IEP if they gave information and it needed to be adjusted and that sort of thing. So it's best to best practice to get the parent input before the meeting. So you can share that out at the meeting and it can be part of that written notice um, rather than following up after the fact. Your follow-up will be that written notice where they can read what was discussed at the meeting. And then they have that seven days notice if they want to come back to you about anything. Okay, any other questions so far? I know there was a oh question about calendar days. Oh, the timeline, it is calendar days, yes, not school days. Mm -hmm. That's a good question because in Muser especially, calendar days and school days are back and forth. Like they are used, I just wish they would stick to one either all calendar or all school, so then we wouldn't get confused. <laughs> okay. I'm not seeing any other questions come up in chat, so I'm gonna keep going. Oh yes, this is a new uh, resource that we have added to our website. Um, again, this link will work if you have the electronic copy of this, and it will take you to the written notice quick reference checklist, we're calling it. So we have one for the IEP, we call it the IEP quick reference document, um, but we had a suggestion to also do one for the written notice. And like I said, the written notice is a little bit tricky because there are very specific things that need to be included to be compliant, which is basically that list that's that I showed at the beginning that's from IDEA and user with those regulations, but there really is no compliance about how you do that. Like, it's just that you have to include that. So it, that's why I say the written notice is very tricky and it's very personalized. It's really how you fill it out. But we're going to go through each section. Um, so the form, the written notice is used to meet the requirements to notify parents at least seven days prior to the date which they um, want these things to 
start the proposed or refused actions. And it can be around any of these things, referral, evaluation, identification, programming, placement, um, informed consent for initial placement of services, and uh, provision of early intervention services or FAPE for a child. So the written notice is basically necessary for everything. Um, and one thing to remember is that it does need to be in understandable language. So this part down here is right from the regulations about what that means to be in understandable language. So on our, what are we calling it? Quick reference checklist. It, it notes that it must be in understandable language. And then you can go to this section of IDA or MUSER and this information is there so you can understand what that is. Um, and just remembering that this whole entire written notice is to inform the parent. So it is really important that the parent is able to read it and understand it. So as much as we like to use our acronyms and our very special ed teacher language that we all use on a daily basis, it's important to keep the parent in mind as much as possible. So here is that uh, first section of the written notice. Um, and this is just, like I said, we break up these uh, quick reference documents and this one's a checklist. So compliance and best practice. Um, so here it's just a reminder that you need to give it to the parents seven days prior. And then best practice is to send it out 10 days for that mail. Um, remember to include those relevant dates. Sometimes it's the date of the team meeting, if it's an actual meeting, but sometimes it's also could be the date of agreement when there's an amendment, but there's no team meeting. So just remember to put a date there and then you check off your purpose. So just like you did for your advanced written notice, um, you would check off your purposes for the written notice. And as we discussed, because that came up as a question, if if you talk about something extra at the written notice that wasn't checked on the advanced written notice, it's okay to put it on the written notice here. So, and you can check multiple. All right, there's a question about who translates these for non-English speaking families. That's a great question. Uh, we have, I know on the main DOE website, we have procedural safeguards in different languages available but we do not have a written notice in a different language. So I guess that would be up to the SAU to find that availability. Um, yeah. Okay, so moving on to the purpose of the meeting. So again, you can check more than one box. Um, so if you're having, if you're talking about multiple things that are here, and then you always have this other, so if you have a manifestation determination meeting that's happening, maybe you're doing a 30-day program review, or even if it's a parent request. Um, also, if you have any students on abbreviated day, it would be best if you checked off that this was your 20-day review or your 45-day review, things like that, just to make it as clear as possible. It's always good to have clear information. And then again, just a reminder about those post-secondary goals and transition services. If you are talking about transition, you really should check that off here um, for post-secondary and transition services. There are times such as a written notice for adding testing options that are not an amendment and do not need a meeting. Are both of these boxes left blank? I, Diane, I'm really sorry. I don't, I'm not really understanding your question. Yeah. Um, like for instance, today um, we were scheduling triennial testing early. So we contacted the parent, wrote a written notice. It didn't require a formal meeting, but it really wasn't an amendment to the IEP because um, it was testing options. So mm -hmm. it doesn't really fit either one of those boxes. I, I guess sometimes I err on saying, putting in a date where it says amendment just so there's a date. 
Yes, I would. I would call that an amendment because, okay. yes, yes, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Section one of the written notice. This is where you're going to describe the actions um, regarding the referral, evaluation, identification, all those things that were listed. So this is where you put those actions that are happening. Um, or determinations. I always think of them as determinations. This is what was decided at the meeting. So you're not saying why, because why is in number two. This is just saying what you're proposing or refusing. So these are some things that may be listed in the proposal or refusal. Um, it could be about a referral. It could be about eligibility decisions agreements that were reached with parents without a meeting. Um, it could be after an IEP meeting to reflect decisions about any of the services, LRE goals, things like that. Um, it could be about transition planning or determining when to start the IEP based on that seven day um, notice to the parent. So any of these things could be listed here. The important thing to remember in section one is to be very specific so that the parents can easily read that and know what is going to be included um, with the decisions that were made from the meeting. So I'm thinking of an annual just being very clear about what decisions were made about how the student met their goals, what they'll be working on coming up, those types of things. Um, and then also a reminder that determinations are made by consensus, not majority. So if consensus isn't reached, the administrator at the meeting um, of the SAU will make the final decision. So if people can't come to an agreement, that administrator of the SAU will be the one that makes the final decision. And then you don't need to talk about the purpose of the meeting in section one. I know sometimes it'll say, we met today for an annual meeting, but you don't need to say that because you've already checked that on the purposes. So there's no need to make that statement. If you do, it's okay, but there's no need. So here's just information about best practice when filling out section one, um, because obviously compliance is just that you describe those actions that are proposed or refused and you're documenting the date that those will begin. So that's what's needed in this section to be compliant. However, if you're thinking about, we need to document things because if you know legal actions were to come up, we need to be very clear about why we made these or what decisions were made. And then in number two, there'll be the why. But best practice, um, I like to think about this section one or number one as an outline, like a table of contents for your IEP, especially if this is an annual. So it's really important to go through each piece of that I or each section. So for example, like section one on the IEP is all that child information. And so you might think about this is where you document the parents waiving the seven day notice um, or giving the procedural safeguards, those types of things. Um, and then thinking about disability, if this is an initial eval, um, talking about that disability identification or a reeval. If not, then maybe you don't talk about that. Uh, and then section three of those special considerations. So, you know, documenting, are there any special considerations for this student? So, you know, just going through each piece and thinking about those goals, the needs of the student, and then any accommodations or modifications in those services that will be needed to meet those needs and goals. So really just thinking about going through the pieces of the IEP and making those determinations about what's going to happen for that student. Then you get to section two, and this is where you explain why the SAU is proposing or refusing to do those things in section one. So section one is just a list basically of like, this is what we're going to do. And then section two is going to explain why. So I also like to think of this as like, I if I were writing written notices right now, I would put like one and one for number one and two, and they would match up 
there would be a decision and then there would be a why. This is why we're doing this. And they would match up. So however you want to do that, like I would use numbers, I would use letters, I, however you want to try to keep those in balance with each other, just so it can equal out. Um, and then I think it's also important to note that if services aren't changing for the child, recording why they're not changing. So just documenting that this is going to stay the same and then why is that going to stay the same? And then again, just remembering that whatever you're putting in here, just making sure that the parents understand and can read it because um, it's really documentation for them. So again, this is just that compliance best practice from our quick reference checklist. The compliance pieces, you explain why those proposals and refusals or why the SAU is proposing or refusing to take those actions from number one. But here's that best practice. So this gives you a little more information about what could be in here. Um, so it goes through each piece. I won't go through each one. But again, it's going to match section one. So it would be from each piece, each section of the IEP, just explaining why you're doing those things. All right. Any questions about those? The, those are like the I mean, that's a big meat of the IEP, really. I mean, of the written notice, sorry. Um, so any questions about the determinations and the why? There are times such as a written notice for adding testing options. Oh, no, I already did that. Just kidding. I thought that was a new question. I already answered that. Um, I have a question. Should yeah. um, eval, like the eval results go into section two? I've been putting them in section three. Right. Section three is where you can put the evaluation results. Okay. Yeah. Like the test scores and things like that. Yeah. Great question. So we'll move right on to that. So this is where you're describing those evaluation procedure assessment, record or report the SAU uh, record or report the SAU used as a basis for the proposed or refused actions. So this is where you're going to list all of those things that you basically your data and your um, information from teacher reports, things like that. So yeah, so this is where you're going to put all of your data, hopefully your team members that come to your meetings, come with data about information that can be used to make those determinations. So whatever data that is given, this is where you would want to record that to help support those determinations that were made and why they were made. So this is kind of like your backup of why those things happened. Um, and then it just says here, you can also document introductions of team members. You can do that here. You can do that in section one, wherever you want to put that. Some people don't do it, don't make that statement. I think that's okay. Also, it's not like a necessary thing, but yes, this is also where you would put those evaluations um, and any updates from teachers. And like I said, hopefully there's some data that comes along with that. So Section three, that compliance is just making sure that there's that description of each of those pieces. Um, and then, you know, best practice is that it reflects the team discussion and supporting data. So whatever is reported out from IEP team members that you feel is important and should be included, and also that supporting data that supports why you're adding goals or taking goals away or, you know, any kind of service or accommodation or anything like that. There really should be information here to support that. So again, it just kind of runs through the seven sections of the IEP, giving you ideas about what you may think about to record here. And excuse me, one, two, and three, it says not addressed in this section because this is all about child information disability considerations. So it's more about the other parts of the IEP, those needs or skill gaps and the goals and the accommodations, modifications and the services. Section four is where you describe any other options uh, that the team, which includes the parent considers and the reasons why those options were rejected. So you can put pretty much anything here. This is some ideas are why you're continuing with the present program or changing the program. Um, maybe you discussed eligibility. Maybe 
you were thinking about a different eligibility category and they didn't it, they didn't qualify or something like that. Uh, you could talk about ESY here or the least restrictive environment statement can be put here. Any of these things can be put in any section, but if you're thinking about other options and what they were considered or why they were rejected, these are just some things that could go here. So again, this is from that uh, quick reference checklist. So you have your compliance where you just put the description of other options um, and why they were rejected. And then some best practice ideas about pretty much the same thing, just about LRE, they, things like that. Section five is about describing any other factors that are relevant to the proposed or refused actions. So these are just some things that may be included here, but don't need to be. And there could be many other things that could be included here. So I, I won't read through the list, but you get the idea. Just some things that aren't usually talked about. So again, compliance is just that you have a description of other factors. Um, and then best practice are those, any other factors that might impact them, you know, attendance, behavior, anything. Then we get to section six, and this is about um, description of the points made by the parent, including the parent's description of their child's progress. So this is just how it sounds. You're really just including a summary of those comments made by the parents. And, um, it's really just giving them an opportunity to voice their opinion and how they're feeling about their child's progress. So just making sure that that's included. Another few pieces that are compliant, but as I've said, like some of them are embedded within the IE, uh, within the written notice. Sorry, I keep calling this thing an IEP. I can't get my forms correct today. Um, there needs to be a statement that the parents have protection under the procedural safeguards. So that's actually embedded within the written notice itself. So hopefully that's there for everybody. Um, and that, that's part of it being included with your vendor if you're using one. And then also that you have sources listed here for parents to contact to obtain assistance in understanding the procedural safeguards because we know that that is a little bit tricky in itself. And so I believe that, again, this is kind of pre-filled it's about being able to contact the due process office of the Maine Department of Education, and it gives some Maine Parent Federation disability rights, those sorts of things. However, there is a part right here where it says uh, the SAU. So again, typically your vendor, this would be pre-filled if you're just printing this out to send home, um, but just maybe double check and make sure it is filled in with your SAU information. But typically it's the special ed director would be the name that's in there. Um, with their position and then the address of like their office and the phone number. So that is the SAU contact and then the main DOE contact to get assistance. Um, best practice really is to leave no section of the written notice blank. Um, but like section five, sometimes there just aren't any things. So just maybe put in NA, not at, none at this time, that sort of thing. We never really like to see blank spots on forms, but sometimes it just isn't anything to put there. So we like to see words just so we know it wasn't completely overlooked. I think that's why we like to see NA or none at this time. Then this is that making sure that the members are listed. So compliances just naming the people that attended the meeting and the titles of each of those members that attended. So if you hold the meeting, like it's an actual meeting, you're going to record those members that were actually a part of the meeting. If there was no meeting held and it's more of an amendment or it's just one of those outside of a meeting written notices, you're going to record the people that are being informed of the decision and when they're informed. So that would be the date here. So if you're informing them on a certain time, then you'll just list them and put that date there. Um, and then our written notice includes this initial provision of services. And so this does need to be signed. Um, 
before providing special education and related services for that initial provision of services. So just someone brand new, they determined eligible for special education. They aren't receiving services at all yet. So you would need to have this signed before services can be provided. If someone is both director and principal, do we list them twice? I don't think that's necessary. I think you can just put their name and then put director slash principal. That's how I would do it. I guess it depends on how your system is set up and your vendor, if you have to do like a title and then a name. So, but if you can not list them twice, I would just list them the one time. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. And again, enclosures. If you're sending anything home along with that written notice, it's best to list those here for documentation. So if you have an eligibility meeting and you have an, one of those eligibility forms, like the adverse effect form or speech and language form, eligibility form, then list that here that you're sending that home with the written notice, that sort of thing. Or if you're sending home procedural safeguards for whatever reason, or if there's a consent to evaluate, things like that. Anything that you'd be sending along with that written notice. All right, any questions about the advanced written notice or the written notice? You guys have had great questions today also. I do wanna just point that out. It's been really good. Um, so just remember, this is our motto on the team. If it's not in the written notice, it didn't happen because like I said, if you really want to be very clear about the decisions that were made and why they were made, and then having that data and information to back up those decisions because of that possible legal ramification, right? This is your legal document saying that this is that these are the decisions and why. Um, and this importance in case law, uh, if you're not familiar, with Andrew F versus the Douglas County School District. This is just a little bit of information about that case. Um, and it's really about a student that wasn't making progress. And so over time, he just had the same IEP from year to year, nothing was updated and no progress was being made. And then he was put into a private school and he started making progress. And so then the parents took the public school to court and wanted reimbursement for tuition. And so they it went all the way, it went through the courts and all of the courts said, nope, the school is in the right. It's merely more than de minimis. And that was the, um, the ruling before this. Uh, and so it went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court were the ones that said, no, this is not okay. All students have the right to have appropriately ambitious goals and the school did not meet its substantive obligation under IDEA. So it should, every student should have an IEP that's reasonably calculated to enable the child to make progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. So the written notice is your vehicle of where you're really documenting all of those attempts for the student to make progress and showing that they are making progress or are not making progress and what you're doing to make it possible for that student to make progress. So just thinking about when you're at an IEP team meeting, you wanna make sure that the progress for the child is around those special ed services outlined in the IEP and those goals that they're working toward and then keeping that data to make sure that they're meeting those and providing appropriate accommodations and modifications for that student. And so just being as clear as possible in that written notice about that progress for the student. Now we do have some other considerations that I just like to put out there because our main job is around compliance. And so we look at these pieces. We have the out of unit placement 
And the written notice is a big um, piece that we look at when we're looking at the out of unit placement process for a student. So if you're sending a student out of district, these are the pieces that we look at. And here it is outlined in IDEA and MUSER. So you can go to this section in MUSER and it clearly outlines what is required for out of unit placement. And these are the pieces that we look at specifically. And you can see over here, we're looking at the written notice for just about all of these things. So just keep that in mind. You can refer back to this if you have a student going out of district. Um, then our other favorite is abbreviated day. And there are two reasons a student can be on an abbreviated day. One is educational and one is medical. So we look at these components because this is very clearly outlined in MUSER about what is expected for documentation for abbreviated day. So I just wanted to put this here for all, all of you if you ever need access to this, this is what is needed to be documented in the written notice. And you can use the um, this citation here to help you get to the section in MUSER to find that outlined very clearly. That's educational. And then this is medical. Medical is a little bit less. These first two, the ADWN and ADLR are the same for both but then these ones change for education and medical. Um, there are a little bit of differences. So that is it for the advanced written notice and written notice. Any last minute questions before we wrap up this afternoon? You're very welcome. Um, I am going to go through a few kind of wrap up we have some resources we like to share, and we have our contact hour feedback form that we'll share with you also. But again, link to the procedural manual. This does take you there. It is great resource. Maine Unified Special Ed Regulations, or MUSER, as I kept talking about during this thing, uh, it was updated in July of 2024. And so this link will take you to the updated version. This is our IEP quick reference document. Yeah, for the IEP. I have been talking about the written notice quick reference checklist. We gotta get our names the same because I can't keep track. Okay, anyway, so this is for the IEP, but it looks very similar to the one that we put together for the written notice. So it's broken up into compliance and best practice, and it puts all of the pieces that we look at for compliance right within the IEP. And Ashley's right on it. She dropped that link in the chat. And she had also dropped the written notice one in the chat way back at the beginning. I forgot to mention that. I saw her doing it. Thank you, Ashley. Um, these are our other resources. We have our PD calendar. You must know how to find that because you're here. And that lists all of our PD that's upcoming. And then we have our second one where it's recordings and PowerPoints. So if you miss it, we try to get it on the website as soon as we can as a recording so you can go back to it. We have more resources, more quick reference documents, eligibility forms, you can check those out there, and then laws and regulations and forms and reporting. This is our PD schedule for the school year for 24-25. You can see we're here today. This is our 10-23 advanced written notice, rent notice. Um, we have a few more coming up through December. And then we do even more on the second, on the back side of, or in the new year, I should say. And we go till the end of May. So please join us. These links will take you to register for these. And then you can attend the training. Um, yeah. This is our feedback and contact our reform. Please give us feedback. We really do appreciate it. We look at it. We take that feedback and apply what we can to make our PD better. So we really do appreciate when you give us feedback. Um, and Ashley dropped that link in the chat also. Thank you. Excuse me. And you can use the QR code. When you are asked to select a training, today's training is today's date, 10, 23, 24. And then it says AWN slash WN. 
excuse me. Main DOE online. You can check us out everywhere. And then this is our contact information because we really are here to support all of you. So please reach out to us if you have questions or if you'd like feedback around anything. We just ask that if you are taking something off of an IEP, written notice, form, whatever it may be, please do not send us the actual form. Copy and paste it out and stick it in an email as a hypothetical with no student information. And we are happy to give you feedback. We give feedback around goals a lot. Um, we answer questions a lot that just come up. If you're like, I, I don't know if this is right, you can ask us. We'll get you an answer, hopefully. So, um, yeah, so please reach out. And I'm going to go back here so you can take a look at that and use that QR code if you need it. Carly, you've got one question in the chat. Just I don't want you to miss that from Diana about the LRE for abbreviated oh. day. Oh, good catch. I did miss that because you started dropping links in there and I yep. lost it. Okay. <laughs> LRE for abbreviated day. Does the percent of LRE still based on a full? Yes, it is. Full school day. That, yes. And I explain it like this. I'll try to do a short version. Kid goes to school for two hours a day. They're in the special ed setting. The whole time, that's 0%. The kid goes to school for two hours a day. They're in the gen ed setting for one hour. It's not one out of two. It's one out of six or whatever your school day is. I always say six, so six, six and a half, whatever. So just keep that in mind. And that is in, I, where do I put that? Oh, I think it's in our abbreviated day training. We do have one, a training just about abbreviated day on our recordings. So if you want to check that out, you can do that on our professional learning page. But yes, full school day. Any other? Oh, I see something. Oh, no, thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> All right. Well, if there are no more questions, we will let you get on with your evening. Happy Wednesday. And uh, join us again. Thank you so much.